Well, good morning, everybody. I thought we'd start off today on the southern side of our current system before we plow into kind of an understanding of the snow on the back side, and then the next two systems are going to follow this. This is just looking at this morning's lightning strikes as the main frontal squall line kind of pushes out of Alabama over toward Florida and then into Georgia and South Carolina. We did have several reports of severe weather last night, all almost lined up along the Gulf Coast or just, you know, a, a few miles inland here. And you can see that uh, four of these reports were tornadoes, including some this morning right here in parts of the Florida Panhandle. And then I think just as I began to record, we were watching one storm that I was uh, keeping an eye on that could potentially be tornadic in parts of, um, of Georgia as well. Looking at the broader structure of this system, this is just a look back over the last 10 hours or so of um, radar, you know, mosaic radar imagery here just to see the sheer size of this system. But that severe weather along the south is, um, is going to have to continue to be monitored throughout the day today. So please, if you're down here stretching from parts of, of Alabama through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida uh, today throughout the, this morning hours and uh, then getting into the late afternoon, let's watch this system very carefully. So make sure that you have a plan in place for when the severe weather does come through. And we had a lot of rain spread through this system up through parts of the Mississippi Valley, a place that desperately needs it, and then this rain that's getting in here to the Ohio Valley. And on the back side of this is where we're getting most of our snow. System number two is coming in to the Pacific Northwest right now, and the third one is still lined up here pretty far uh, out in the open Pacific Ocean, meaning the uncertainty in its projected path is, is still relatively high. But what I can tell you is that this will be the northernmost of these systems in terms of its track through the central plains into the Midwest and New England. The next one will come a bit farther to the south, and the one following that will be even farther to the south. It's all about the placement of the cold air, and the snow certainly helps out a lot with that. Speaking of the snow, I want to show you a couple of maps. Um, so because of the time in the morning I record these, uh, we only have data through, you know, um, late last night. So this is through, um, <clears throat> excuse me, through 7 p.m. Um, mountain time or, or 6 p.m. central time last night, just taking a look at the last 72 hours worth of snow. So blizzards uh, conditions throughout parts of Kansas into Nebraska here where we had 6 to 10 some places picking up a foot of snow. And again, this was through 6 p.m. central time last night. As the snow began to move into Missouri and then into Iowa, after this, we've added up more snow in those areas. So what I can do is I can flip this over to a six-hour accumulation map and then include data up until midnight last night. So you can see it moving into parts of southeastern Kansas, and this is where the heavier snow began around midnight last night through early this morning, already packing in, in some places, over five to six inches, based on some reports I had um, from... Um, and some of the National Weather Service offices around here. So this has been a pretty uh, potent system on, on both ends. And of course, we're going to watch the next one coming into the Pacific Northwest following it. That again will be system number two of three that we're going to keep an eye on. On the rainfall side of this through 5 a.m. this morning, uh, we did notice that some of the rainfall totals down here, uh, there was also hail mixed in with this. But uh, we can see that uh, some of these totals here are easily in the three to five inch rain. Uh, range, excuse me, and remember this is one of our driest spots uh, in the country compared to relative uh, moisture over the last six months. So desperately needed rainfall, though a lot of it in one short amount of time is uh, is not the recipe for kind of gently breaking a drought scenario. But this is going to continue to add up over the next two systems that come through here, including the severe weather threat with the system that's going to follow, and I'll show you that in just a few moments. But as it stands, uh, about 5.50 this morning, this was our all-hazards weather map. Widespread wind event that's going to spread up the East Coast. This is all flood watch that's been issued. Remember, there was a lot of snow on the ground here. And so this rain that's coming with this system that's going to pull to the north is going to fall on top of that snow, creating a flood risk. Uh, this shading of color all over the map represents uh, winter storm warning. And uh, it's kind of interesting, if you look across the country, there's really only one state here in the lower 48 that does not have some sort of weather watch advisory or warning, and that state is North Dakota. So North Dakota is the lone state left out of, of, of all of this. Come back into the west, we still have the blizzard warnings up for the Cascades, winter storm warnings that stretch down into Oregon, California. Very cold air on the back side of it, so you can see the freeze warnings in California's Central Valley and all the way down into southern Arizona. But widespread wind event here, I'll show you that in a moment, plus the, um, plus the snow that's coming in has issued these winter storm uh, warnings as well. So um, just continue to see this. This map's not going to get any less colorful over the next five to seven days as these next few systems roll through. 
I did want to show you the winds this morning as the low is kind of wrapping itself up here pretty far to the north in Illinois and Indiana. Widespread strong winds, 30 to 50 mile an hour gusts on the back side. And then as the frontal squall line sweeps through, uh, this is going to be producing its own local thunderstorm force winds, which are going to be quite fast as well. But up these coasts, you're bringing in that flow off of the very warm water here, uh, part of the Gulf Stream and then just this section of the Atlantic. And this is what's going to support a lot of uh, rain out of this falling on where that snow was. And then on the back side, our next system has come in. You can see the very strong winds that are coming to Washington, Oregon. These are, of course, enhanced by the mountains and the flow over those mountains. And uh, this is why we have all those wind advisories, watches, and warnings throughout much of the western United States. Okay, so today's uh, SPC outlook shows us a pretty broad area of enhanced risk of severe storms. This includes all three major threats, so tornado, wind, and hail. And as we watch the storm system kind of move through that area on the high-res NAM, you can see a pretty sizable frontal squall line right there that through this afternoon and this evening is going to sweep out of Georgia and Florida into the Carolinas and up into Virginia as well. So don't be surprised here, thunder pretty far to the north in this system. On the back side of it, we have pretty tight spaced isobars, tightly spaced isobars indicating some strong winds. The conversion over to snow for parts of Illinois and Indiana that have had rain today. You're going to watch the snow leave Iowa and Missouri, come into more of Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana tonight. But it's um, not going to be useful to use like a 10 to 1 ratio on this because of how wet things were from the rainfall and how mild they are out ahead of it. So the snow is going to be quite slushy as it hits the ground in this area, but very strong winds on the back side of this low. Now, as that rain presses into parts of Pennsylvania and New York and further into New England here, the snow does follow it coming out of the Great Lakes, sweeping through the Ohio Valley. But this is not uh, heavy snow on the back side of this. You're going to have to wait for the next system to really add up the snow here. So let's kind of follow that system out Wednesday, getting into uh, Wednesday afternoon and evening. And there is a little system on a short wave behind it by Wednesday evening coming into parts of North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois, right in through here. So we'll watch out for that frontal boundary and the snow it's going to produce. But then what we'll keep an eye on is the system coming into the northwest. So let's watch the northwest today under those strong winds, some locally very heavy snows here, a frontal boundary that sweeps out right there into eastern Montana. That's the one that eventually gets over here to produce the snow by Wednesday night. And then this will be the next system we're going to watch gather late in this forecast run from the um, from the NAM. You can already see it making its pull on the moisture. See this down here in Louisiana, Texas at the very end? That's the rebound in moisture that this one's going to use on its more southerly storm track as it goes through. Now in terms of winds, we kind of mentioned this a lot yesterday, but I want to add them up for you again. This is maximum accumulated wind gusts. And it's going to include all three of the next systems here in this forecast. And we can see that from the northwest through the plains, coming over the Rockies, of course, and then almost the entirety here of the eastern United States expecting to have winds at some point over the next three systems that uh, get above uh, 30 to 50 miles an hour. So very, very windy conditions overall with this system. But here they are stacked up. Here's system number one with all of that support from the subtropical jet. Remember we talked about this the other day. Kind of divide up that trough. Strongest upper level support is right here. So there's a jet streak. There's a jet streak right in the middle is where we get our deepest low forming. And this one's going to pull to the north. And the main reason for that is kind of the tilt on this trough. Okay, so that tilt coming up in that angle allows us to lift through New England, which is why they're going to be seeing some more in terms of the uh, rainfall in New England versus snow. But then it's the speed coming in the backside of this trough, and then the speed coming in the backside of this trough that produce the next two systems that roll over the west and into the central United States. Now I want to show you um, just a, we look at this map every once in a while, but it's just kind of a point I want to make here about the low pressure track. I'm going to focus primarily here on the central U.S. and east um, as this next few systems come through. So this morning, this is the cluster of low pressure systems, excuse me, the cluster of lows in each of the uh, European ensembles forecast. So remember, when we do an ensemble forecast, we run the model many, many times. So you can see they're pretty tightly spaced because it's you know forecasting for this morning. So there should be very good agreement. Now that low is going to spread throughout the day today through Illinois and Indiana, and then into Michigan, finally find its way into Ontario and Quebec. See that? Here is the low that the low pressure, the lower pressure that's going to be around that frontal boundary that sneaks through by the time we get into Wednesday afternoon and evening. You can see kind of just spread out elongated area of low pressure. But this is not the next big system. The next big system forms right here 
on Thursday afternoon and evening coming out of the Panhandle area. Now, if you remember, the first low started in Illinois and moved up in this direction, right? Let's see where this next one that comes out of the Panhandles is going to go. So on Friday morning right here, getting into Friday afternoon and evening, do you see how that low started in the Panhandles, kind of hooked a bit south and is now over, you know, almost over Paducah. That's where the, the center of low pressure is. So you can see that's moved south about, I don't know, 150, 200 miles. Why? There's more colder air for this to work with, so the storm track shifts to the south. And then that low, instead of just immediately going toward Michigan, comes out of Paducah toward Indiana. So you can see we've shifted all of this farther to the south. And what's the point? Well, the point is the heavy snows on this current system are, are here. We could just take this and shift it farther to the south and east with the next system. That's how that works. It's always about 150 miles to the northwest of the lows when you start to meet the heavy snow bands. So to move this farther to the south and east is, is the game. So this one goes through and now it exits closer to London, Ontario versus you know way up here in central Ontario. And that low is going to pull out into um, you know this part of Quebec. Now the next system has a bunch of high pressure that builds in before it. So as it comes over the mountains here, it's actually going to ride the very southern edge of this high pressure. Now where are we in time? This is Sunday morning, getting into Sunday afternoon and evening. And as we work our way out there into Monday and Tuesday, you're going, to, wait a minute, I don't see a low. And that's right, you won't see this next low because where this is getting forced is on the southern edge of this high pressure. So it's almost an entirely different setup for precipitation. What we've got here is we've got flow opened in the mid-levels from the Gulf of Mexico, icy cold air from the south, and you're just getting frontogenesis in this area. So you see warm, moist air on the northern, or excuse me, on the southern side running over the cold air that's coming out of the north and northwest. So there almost isn't a system to be resolved when we get out there to next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's born on high pressure, and that's what's going to shove this system farther to the south, increase the risk of ice in where I'm drawing this current arrow right in through here. And this is going to be producing snow even farther to the south. So see how this is kind of setting up for these next few systems between now and January 17th. The net effect of all of it is, is that the pattern's active. This all enters through the northwest. It enters through, uh, you know, northern California. And then the storm systems form here, and one rolls like this, another one rolls like that, and the third one comes even farther to the south. But net effect of all of this is there's very little places around the United States that are going to be quiet. And it may only be Southern California. And Southern California's got its moisture coming in the week, too, so don't, don't sit on that area. All right, Port, importance of this. Each one of those systems is going to hit this area, which has major subsurface soil moisture issues. And as you know, because of the trajectory, in other words, the, only the last one is digging out of the northwest, the soils aren't frozen. We're going to put some of this moisture in. There's going to be melt before, or excuse me, after uh, the storm system rolls through, which means we're going to work hard against this, which means I, I'm looking forward next week to seeing where the uh, Mississippi River down here in Memphis will be at that stage. But with that next system coming through, this is on the 11th, we're going to watch again for parts of Texas and Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi to run the risk of some severe storms. So with all of that as a setup, let me show you what's actually going to happen here by comparing the GFS to the European model. We've already diagnosed this current system, so this is through midday today, getting into this evening. You can see the conversion back over to snow here in both models. System number two comes into the northwest. We're going to watch through Wednesday uh, morning, Wednesday midday, Wednesday evening. And there's the lighter snow that comes in on Wednesday into early Thursday with that frontal boundary we mentioned. Then keep an eye on what happens out of the four corner states by Thursday evening, getting now into early Friday morning, going further into Friday midday, again watching for the risk of those strong to severe storms farther to the south again. This will be on Thursday night and again here on Friday. And playing this out, now do you see how much farther to the south the snow gets in both models? All of that is based on the change in trajectory of the low. And as we get out there to Friday night into early Saturday morning, that's when this is really going to crank up in this area and deliver a lot of snow, but more rain into New England because this system is still lifting. Here comes our third system. There it is by Saturday morning. You can see that the European model is a bit farther to the south with it. The GFS is farther to the north. And then that system dives in to the west and then emerges on the nose of high pressure 
by the time we get into Monday and Tuesday. Now, do you see where that snow is coming in Monday and Tuesday? Look at the European model down here. A lot of uncertainty. Don't yet know this, but I will tell you there will be cold air, antecedent cold air as I keep calling it, in place for running the risk of snow in this area. Okay, so we have to keep an eye out on that. Plus, to the south, more strong to severe storms with this next system. Now, after this, the European model tosses yet another low. This is way out there on the 17th and 18th into the west, and it's not being resolved yet by the GFS. So we'll have to keep an eye on that getting out there pretty far. But as it stands, this is your next seven days forecast total precipitation from the European model. Here it is from the GFS. We see some decent similarities here, but the subtle differences in this are important to pick out. So notice how much wetter the European model is to the south, how much wetter the European model is into California versus the GFS, which is wetter through here, and also with the second system coming into this part of the Midwest. So this is just a quick model comparison between those seven day forecast runs. On the snowy side of it, let's add it up. We're gonna use operational runs to begin with here through Wednesday. Here comes system number two on Friday. Saturday, we're going to park this out there at one week. And remember, we're using 10 to 1 snow ratios. This is where we could get ourselves in trouble looking at these maps and taking them verbatim because a 10 to 1 snow ratio doesn't work with how mild the system is and how much um, uh, rain uh, precedes it. But I do want to point out that the snow you're getting down here is from that third and final system beginning next Monday coming into this area. But the risk right in through here is highest for the heaviest snows and you can also see the Cascades, the Sierra Nevada, and the Rockies picking up quite a bit as well. Let's do the same thing for the GFS. Thursday, Friday, Saturday now. Getting out there, we're going to park it at one week, and I'll just do a quick comparison. There's European, there's the GFS. It's important to note that it is the European model that takes system number three, see it down here next Monday, and just rips it through the New England area by next Wednesday. And the GFS, starting at that same time, does not do that. Okay. So there's already differences showing up once we get out there past a week. I do want to mention the ice threat with the third system. So you can see it spreading out of Texas into parts of the mid-Atlantic. The risk, again, is because that cold air comes in out of the north and undercuts the very warm and mild air that will be still racing over the top of it out of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to watch this area very carefully for the risk of ice. Now what we need to do next is look at the probability maps here is the chance of getting an inch. Okay, I'm just trying to show some of that could get pretty far into the south and mid-south here in the next 10 days. Here's our probability of three inches over the next 10 days. Chance of getting six inches. So we've got these two main areas, one here and of course the west. Here's the probability of a foot. Now remember, this is using a 10 to 1 ratio. We're literally just taking the snow flag out of these forecast model runs, multiplying by 10. So if it says there's moisture and it says there's snow, it's going to be a form of snow, multiply by 10 and you get the value. So now we can see that probability very high for a foot here. There's the 18 inch risk area, of course the Cascades here, 24 inch risk area, could get some lake enhancement out of this. Remember the lakes are almost completely unfrozen right now, so this cold air coming in behind it could start to crank up a lake effect snow machine going. Uh, and this is 36 inches, so we're still looking at the Cascades at that point. Now, if we flip this over to the total precipitation side of it, who's going to be drier? Parts of the Canadian Prairie, parts of the Northern Plains, west of about the 100th meridian is not looking at picking up much more precipitation out of this, and the southwest over the next 10 days. But on the wetter side of it, here's the probability of an inch. Here's the probability of two inches of liquid out of this. That's very high in these areas. And then here's the probability of four inches of liquid out of this. Next, I do want to show you that by day 10, we still have our higher latitude kind of blocking setup. So there's ridges of high pressure here and here that keeps the storm track farther to the south, right? We talked about that yesterday. But what we do notice is as we push this out to about the 21st of January, we go back over to this very El Nino looking setup. In other words, the jet just comes across you know, much of the northern hemisphere in this very zonal pattern, quite strong coming off of Japan and staying to the south. Now the point here is that it's going to split and do a flow like this through the Canadian prairie into the plains, and that's going to give us a drier signal through that whole region. But it will start to bring up the better chances for getting wetter conditions into the rest of California. As you can see in all three of these week two forecasts, but drier in week two out here. This would be the 16th to the 22nd. All right, temperatures. This is our frost risk over the next seven days. We're going to be pushing that cold air pretty far to the south over the next seven days. Whoops, 
just didn't mean to close that off. Let's go back and open that. Max temperatures. Here we go. Well, maybe there we go. There's Tuesday morning or Tuesday's highs getting into Wednesday and Thursday, and this is when the really cold air starts to come in. So if we just go back, they'll be in the 40s in Montana today, and then by the time we get into Thursday, the high temperatures will struggle to get out of the single digits. It was repressed into Friday. Now it's minus 10 for a high. We get into Saturday. That cold air invades the plains, pushes pretty far to the south. So this is the setup for the system coming out on Monday. That colder air pressing to the south. There it is on Sunday and then on Monday. So what we're going to see here is just overrunning right in this area. That's what we're going to see. So pretty dramatic swing in temperatures here over the next seven days, dropping in some pretty brutally cold air. In five-day chunks, here's your next five days. We've already seen that. This is day five through 10 when I expect that colder air to make it clear to the Gulf Coast and into Florida. And then once we get out there day 10 through 15, you just saw it. The, the more mild air starts to push in from the west. It's just the jet stream gives us more of an El Nino type look. Now, I do want to mention, following up with yesterday, that the longer range outlook now from January 18th to February 18th continues that El Nino type jet stream pattern. So it just stays south with the subtropical component. The polar jet comes over the top like this. So that's why we see drier air in here. Northwest flow in winter is not the setup for moisture. So that's overall what we're picking up on in the flow. I'm concerned about the Cascades after that and the Northern Rockies should El Nino be the dominant pattern. But I want to put together some comments on the El Nino here as we just wrap up the U.S. outlook. And that is as we watch this El Nino continue to fade going forward, there's a pretty substantial difference. We talked about it yesterday between the European model and the CFSV2. The CSV2 crashes this thing very quickly. The European lingers with the El Nino. As I mentioned yesterday, it'll be the interplay between El Nino and the colder waters of the north, that negative PDO signal that we're going to have to watch carefully. And just to compare the models, if the NMME, which features the CFSV2, fades quickly, what it wants to do is just spread dry conditions back into the plains of the United States and the Midwest. And it's going to do that after March, April, May, which is the maps we're looking at here. But as it stands, if El Nino is still present, there could be the risk of some tight planting windows and very wet conditions in the southeast. That's in both models. But because the European fades it more slowly, it's got a wetter spring over a broader area than the NMME does. So the NMME brings in La Nina as fast as it can. The uh, ECMWF is slower with that progression. Okay, internationally, the next 10 days, quite cold. We saw the cold air coming out here, but notice much of Europe and Russia, very cold. Quite warm throughout much of, of the rest of Asia, though, including um, you know parts of the Middle East and, and India and China. Excuse me. But I want to give you this global picture on precip. Heavy rains coming into Argentina, more on that in a second. Still better rains coming into this section of Brazil's center west region. But notice how wet it's going to be in parts of, of South Africa, Southern Africa, forgive me, and then South Africa. And then you can see the very wet conditions continuing in the eastern part of, uh, of Australia. This is very uncharacteristic of El Nino. But let's finish this up by talking a bit about South America. I want to show you some of the newest data here. Uh, so we're looking at stations, uh, uh, weather stations here. This is Buenos Aires. Cordoba is over here. In fact, let's go and look at Pilar, one of my favorites. Uh, that recent rainfall event I mentioned yesterday, so this is 100 millimeters in one day. They had it close to 150 millimeters, and that is um, six inches of rainfall. That long-standing drought problem there is getting broken with incredibly heavy rains. Uh, back over to Buenos Aires, let's just click in a you know spot here in Buenos Aires. You can see that their long-standing drought has been broken this spring with decent rains coming through. So that's a, a major positive note. And if we kind of come up the Parna River, which rolls through here, you know, into Santa Fe, I'll just click on a station near there. And uh, what you'll see again is rains lately breaking this. Now, you'll notice the color bar shifted, right? We now have up to 200 millimeters, which is eight inches of rain. So these events are big. These are one to two inch rainfall events right here. So uh, right there along the Parna River, really kind of breaking that drought. Okay, what's coming? Well, here's the high res European model daily flashes of green indicating monsoon going on and repeated frontal boundaries sweeping through Argentina. Watch it again kind of fast. So you can see the setup here. Who misses out on this? It's primarily this area here is going to be drier. But outside of that, Argentina, multiple chances of storms. The monsoon is pushing through the center west region. It won't be until we get out there in week two before things start to slow down. So over the next 10 days, this is the chance of getting at least two inches of liquid uh, out of that flow. All right. 
Now beyond that, we are expecting that the northern growing areas get a bit of a drier go of it as we press toward, toward the week finishing on the 23rd. See this? Still wet south, maybe better moisture trying to come back into the east. But the big question I have is, do we really see at the end of the month wetter conditions move in here? And as you can tell, if you watched yesterday, this has now gone over even wetter. This is going to be during harvest time period. This wet conditions are not good for harvest time period. Okay, so we'll watch that carefully as a major possible story. And then finally, I just want to show you the new seasonal update. We spent a lot of time in the U.S. yesterday. I'm just going to give you the update for South America quickly here. Right now, my concern is that with El Nino and its speed at which it fades in the European model, we could be contending with a dry April in this area, or drier April. And moisture in April is critical to the success of the Safrina crop, which will be getting planted over the next six to eight weeks. So to see the conditions still being forecast drier in this area is something I want to watch. So that's what I've got for you this morning. Uh, we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks.